we were building for ourselves and we were building for the mobile world and this kind of user, the, the classic, we were solving our own problem. And I think that's how, you know, you see it pay off well down the line. Hi, everyone. You're listening to Scaling DevTools, the show that investigates how DevTools go from zero to one. I'm joined today by Gabe Savitt, who is the CEO of Runway. And Runway is a mobile release management platform. Gabe, thanks so much for joining. Um, could you share a little bit about yourself and Runway and how you got to where you are today? For sure. Thank you, Jack, for having me. Excited to, excited to be here um, and share a bit about uh, what the team and I are up to. Um, and how we got here. So, uh, so yeah, runway mobile release management. Um, two sort of underlying themes that we might come back to. Um, one is automation. Understanding there's like a lot of moving pieces in uh, in the sort of release cycle for mobile teams, playing out across a lot of tools. Um, and this is more than just your build pipeline. Um, so we sort of connect to CI/CD, but we also sort of span from. Um, your version control, a lot of the gate wrangling, that part of the process through project management tools, through, of course, connecting to the, the different app stores, um, and, uh, and then also to stability monitoring tools to capture sort of health of releases. Um, so connecting across these and automating as much as possible end to end, um, for folks, um, without any scripting or, uh, diverting product engineers resources to, uh, to the less fun stuff. So that's one side. And the other big one um, is around collaboration and how teams work together and understanding, especially for mobile. There's a lot of interdisciplinary involvement. There's a lot of sort of gated steps because you're shipping binary um, and uh, creating a place where the sort of cross section of a team, engineering product, QA, um, engineering managers, other stakeholders, they can all get eyes on the state of releases, what's happening across the team to chip in along the way. Um, and so it really turns into sort of this collaboration tool as well. So a uh, long winded explanation to try to paint some of the picture of what we're building. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's in mobile teams, it's always hard in a sense, like what version of the app of, are you testing and all this, sort, like, it's always, you know, obviously different app stores and stuff always a pain and still, right. For a lot yeah. of teams that aren't using Runway. Yeah, there's a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of things to keep tabs on and across a team of any kind of scale, you're going to have all sorts of different sort of um, maybe feature focused teams contributing. I mean, again, it's like this, this many to one where you have a lot of folks, different parts of the company, maybe working on mobile. Um, and that all has to sort of coalesce into one place and then ship with a single binary. So there's that sort of coordination angle. Um, there's always sort of the versioning problem with shipping again for mobile or binary. You have this long tail of different versions that you have to support. So having a clear picture of, um, what your user base is actually seeing, what they're all on, um, sort of wrangling the different, uh, flavors of builds that you might be distributing. Um, and, uh, of course the third party ecosystem problem. So dealing with Apple and Google, um, who interestingly, increasingly, people have probably heard of the Apple review process, where every time you submit a new version, folks on the Apple side need to get eyes on it and, and check it out and might, might reject the update. Uh, Google does that too. Um, and anecdotally, uh, increasingly on the Google side, which is interesting. Um, so, so yeah, that's sort of a third party uh, element that creates a lot of uncertainty in the process for teams. And, um, uh, yeah, there's a lot to, to kind of stay on top of increasing number of different platforms to ship for different flavors that you can ship for from smaller form factors like watches to um, TV stuff, of course, to phones themselves. So, yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's awesome. And I, I always feel like the mobile experience is a lot kind of lacking compared to what web developers have. And like, there's, there's a lot more like configuration and just like doing kind of annoying stuff in mobile. I feel like, yeah, that's uh, that's part of what led us here um, is these two two kind of things happening at once. One, mobile is continuing to grow as an important platform for uh, for companies. Um, users are spending more time on these other platforms, and uh, it becomes bigger and bigger revenue driver for for these these companies. So, uh, increasing importance at the same time, you're not seeing sort of matching 
attention paid to the mobile development um, and release experience. Um, so tooling is lagging behind a little bit um, and just sort of the specialized stuff that you you kind of need to have in place to to be very smoothly um, and collaboratively shipping updates and, and going through the, the whole process there. Um, that's sort of lagging. And that's where we um, are fitting in. And that is, uh, that's also, yeah, part of the, part of the origin story. We're a team of our founders are um, former mobile engineers, um, including myself. And uh, so we've lived that experience, you know, building and shipping for mobile on different kinds of teams, different scales, different kinds of products um, and uh, kind of compared experiences. We've been sort of worked together many, many years ago uh, at Rent the Runway um, as their first iOS team. And uh, we all, just about all of us, dispersed to different mobile teams, but remained friends and started comparing notes and sort of realizing um, a lot of these sort of pain points, friction, inefficiency, um, kind of quality issues that exists in the process um, is common to a lot of teams, um, just about all teams. Um, and it sort of manifests in different ways. Um, and uh, and we thought we could uh, we thought we could tackle it. Yeah. So you, you took a lot away from that uh, experience. Uh, one stupid question is everyone very well dressed in the, the runway team? Um, yeah, our, our female colleagues, uh, for sure. So rent the runway, uh, uh, yeah, doesn't do menswear. Um, and so, uh, yeah, but they had a nice employee perk and it was a good way of getting folks to dog food, the product, of course, um, where folks could be renting, renting stuff and, and yeah, that was fun. So stylish office. That's, that's awesome. And so how did you kind of get started? Was it like you were just like in a bar or something, like everyone talking like, ah, oh, this sucks. Like we should just fix this or. Yeah, it's, it's actually, it's interesting. We, uh, so like I said, we, you know, remained friends, even though we ended up working different places, you know, we're in touch, um, regularly, but it really came together. There's sort of a aligning of stars, um, and came together during COVID. Um, and so we were all in separate places, um, and actually had a group, I think it was like a group thread maybe on WhatsApp and, uh, kept in touch there. And, um, we had actually always talked about working together, um, more in a sort of agency setting or, or, or setting up something like that where we could all, cause we had the full, you know, the full spectrum of every, everyone you need and just create this sort of little small, um, uh, agency and build awesome apps where people work together that way. Um, and then we sort of, you know, broadened that and started talking about what are some other problems we could solve? Um, what would it look like to kind of build a, build a startup, um, together and, uh, literally started with a shared, uh, this WhatsApp thread and then a shared, uh, Google doc. Um, and yeah, I mean, I guess I don't know the initial sort of trigger, like what triggered it all. But once that was there, we started dropping in some, some ideas and, uh, one of, uh, one of my co-founders dropped in the, the release management idea, jotted some notes there and it immediately resonated the, the process of running a release was something I remembered like viscerally, uh, different teams set this up differently, but very often on a team, if you don't have a dedicated sort of person for this or a team, you will share the load across your different engineers um, and maybe PMs, maybe QA. Um, and so there's this rotation that's set up where for any given release, um, and you might be releasing weekly or biweekly, it would be like common for, for kind of fast moving mobile teams. Um, there's going to be a different point person each time. It's like a round robin. Um, and so I remembered every time it was my turn, you know, if you have a largest team, your turn is not so often, but it's just often enough. Uh, it comes around, you have forgotten how to do everything. You go into this sort of, um, checklist that lives in like a spreadsheet somewhere or doc. Uh, it's not kept up to date. There's like little holes and gaps. You end up needing to ask other folks for kind of their input along the way. Um, and it's also just a week or two weeks of split attention. You know, you're having to keep tabs on the release and keep track of progress and loop in the right people at the right time. Um, and for, for a product focused engineer, that's not, that's not fun. You want to build, you want to, you know, do your, do your job and not kind of be a traffic cop or uh, kind of manage the sort of admin that comes along with releases. So yeah, kind of visceral yeah. and it resonated immediately. 
Um, and we all sort of started circling around it. We were like, why, why had we been dealing with these spreadsheets and docs? And like, why was there so much confusion and noise on Slack each and every time we released? Um, there really should be a better way to, uh, take over some of the workload again with automation, but also for the parts where you do need to collaborate, give that a home and, and sort of like, make more transparent the key piece of info that just each and every release we're getting passed back and forth just ad hoc so yeah we kind of took that and and ran with it yeah and what, what was the first like kind of step or or launch or how did you get started first step was a whole bunch of uh interviews um so we obviously had the first hand experience we already had a good amount of um you know conviction about the problem space and what a solution maybe could look like um, but we wanted to validate that. Um, and so before we started writing single line of code, um, we set up as many calls as we could with folks in our network, um, former teammates, um, folks that we knew working in mobile on other teams, um, friends of friends, like any connections on different kinds of teams, different sizes of teams. Um, we, we had the thought early on that this is something for, for mobile teams period. Um, that's kind of the ICP. If you're more than maybe more than two mobile engineers working on something and shipping it regularly, this is something for you. And so we had a lot of conversations with a lot of different kinds of teams, um, and had a lot of questions and also just let people talk and sort of describe their existing process to get a sense for sentiment around it, who was involved, um, and, uh, other pain points and, and friction that we might not have identified. Um, and, uh, so that was super helpful. Um, and it wasn't a hundred percent hit to be honest. Like we, we had, we had to have a mix of the, the personal conviction, um, and some of these additional data points, um, because often you talk to folks on teams who, um, maybe they are part of a larger team with a rotation and don't have to deal with this process so much. So maybe they last ran a release a while ago. It's out of their mind and they're not really remembering the pain and the frustration and the friction that exists. Um, and so you get a sort of uh, less acute response. Um, and then sometimes you talk to folks who are actually not involved in the process. Again, depends on the team setup. Um, and, you know, we should have then obviously and tried to get to someone closer to the process. But um, you have folks who sort of are viewing it from the outside. If you're on a team that sort of has a, a subset of folks or a different group running releases you can kind of look from the outside and be like oh works pretty well you know we get our work in we get our prs merged and qa'd and and then they just you know go out the door with the train um and so it's harder to um you know pick up on on some of the pain and friction that exists and also the failure modes um, it may look to you as if you're just merging code and, and it goes out the door um but sometimes that feedback loop is not closed where you're shipping regressions or maybe there's some integration kind of issue with other work going in and it's someone's job to sort of um, triage and solve that. Um, and so, so yeah, a blend. Something we found is like releases aren't always top of mind for, for everyone on a, on a mobile team at any given time. Um, and so mixing the inputs from, from interviews and also the, the personal experience and the conviction. Um, and then, uh, and then going from there. Yeah. And so you kind of had some feeling that there was this issue, you heard it a little bit, but there was still not, you know, full, you know, 100%. This is, this is absolutely guaranteed to work. What was it like then? What was the next step after that? Once you kind of had gathered that feedback? Yeah. I mean, we got to a point where we were kind of happy with the, the direction, the, the feedback and input we had. And, uh, and then we started building, um, you know, that's first and foremost, that's what our, our team's background is, it's, you know, my background, I'm engineer and a product focused engineer, I guess you'd say, which is true of a lot of mobile folks. This is also sort of a factor, I think, in this whole deal is in the mobile world, you have a lot of engineers who love building product. And so they're naturally less, um, less into the whole tooling and, and automation and scripting stuff. Um, that has changed a little bit as mobile has matured and you get more specialists who do kind of mobile tooling, mobile DevOps automation stuff. Um, but, but you tend to find more of these product engineers who would love to just with no, um, with no friction and no, no other tasks on their plate, just build and ship product. Um, 
so anyway, that's our team's origin. Um, and so we got to work building. Um, I think we were pretty heads down building for maybe three, four months, maybe a bit longer. <laughs> and uh, it all kind of blurs together now. And uh, <clears throat> tried to get uh, an MVP into people's hands um, ASAP. Um, and this was really tough because the nature of Runway as a tool um, is that it is very broad. It's meant to connect across your whole tool chain. So there's a lot of different tools involved. Um, it's meant to sort of cater to these different sort of roles on the team um, and a pretty expansive process. Um, and to kind of go to market with an MVP of that is is hard. Um, and we felt that the the sort of breadth of it, the framework aspect was was inherent. Like it's it's crucial. Um, so thinking about descoping it or starting with a, one integration, one part of the process, um, we we didn't have confidence that we could go out there and, and really get that as a foot in the door and also weren't excited by it. It wasn't the vision. Um, and so I guess, you know, people, people offer different advice on this front in terms of how you scope things, how you sort of maybe um, kind of chop things up to, to get something out quickly and get an MVP out quickly. Um, we wanted to at least get the breadth into the MVP, even if it was thin. So we talk about the tool being kind of like very broad, um, but thin to start with kind of this, this layer sits on top, um, gives you just enough of the sort of connective tissue that you start getting a sense for, um, what, what sort of power it can bring. Um, so anyway, that's how we started. We built sort of the end to end piece with the first set of integrations. Um, ASAP. Um, and we started obviously talking to a few teams um, from our network um, that folks had been on before uh, and tried to convince them to uh, to give this first version a shot. Um, and that's also no mean feat because, and this is something we're still contending with and still kind of, we've come a long way on, but um, because Runway is so broad and so fundamental, it is sort of it becomes very tightly coupled to how teams do things. It becomes sort of like part of the fabric of the way these teams are working. Um, that's obviously great. Once you're in the door, things are sort of up and running. It becomes the new, the new normal, the better way of doing things. Uh, before that, it's tricky because like we, we pop up in so many different parts of a team's process and we, um, affect or, or could affect um, or be used by so many different people on the team. Um, and so there's some sort of behavior change, perhaps some friction um, to convince folks to even try it because from the outside, um, it feels like there might be some lift for a team. We weren't charging at this point, of course, the first few pilots, you know, free, um, give this a shot. Um, so in theory, there's no hurdle there. There's no friction, but still it can be seen as disruptive to a product engineering org, you know, operating and shipping at scale. They need to make sure their releases are getting out the door. Um, and they have very busy engineers who sort of can't be, um, you know, onboarding or learning a new tool. Um, so yeah, that was one of the early, early kind of frictions is build just enough that folks want to give it a try. It's going to have a couple of nuggets of kind of time saving value there for them or, or kind of the, the, better way of working that improves kind of how the team's collaborating, reduces some of that, that overhead um, and enough that it, it sort of outweighs um, the little bit of work they might need to put in as well. Yeah. I, I was actually going to ask uh, on your like very first customer or like first user, do you remember how you kind of persuaded them to <laughs> give you a shot? Yeah. It was a lot of a lot of dialogue um, for sure. We looped them in like even before we just like handed something over. They were definitely involved um, as we were building out the MVP. Um, so I guess what you call a design partner for sure. Um, make them feel a part of the process, and of course, in doing so, uh, make sure you're hitting some of the high notes that they would want to see um, out of the gate. So it was a lot of conversations like that for sure. Um, we were also. Yeah, I mean, it's a bit of, of luck or maybe we generate this, but like you get someone who really believes in the vision. And so they're, they're going to understand, you know, this MVP is going to be a shadow of, of what's to come. 
Um, but we're going to buy in now. We're going to help you kind of build it out um, because we like the direction it's going. We, we can see kind of where this is headed. Um, so you get that buy-in again, like rapport building. And of course we had these connections from past teams, um, but working with them as we sort of laid out and started to build towards that vision, um, getting that buy-in and, uh, and going from there. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. And how many of these kind of like very, very invested people early on did you have? Cause it seems like you probably wouldn't need that many, or, or maybe you couldn't even manage having many of those at the beginning. Yeah, we had, uh, I think we had three. That was kind of the first cohort. It was three teams who, yeah, more or less look like our current ICP, like medium to largest teams, um, shipping critical, mission critical mobile products. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so we started with those three. Um, and, uh, yeah, it was a lot, of course. Um, we also, uh, during this time, we were in YC, so we were going through the batch and, and working with these teams too. And there was a lot, just a lot, lot going on. Um, but uh, but yeah, it went pretty well, all things considered. Yeah, and how do you kind of um, like they're probably sending you like, oh, we need this, we need this. Like, I, I would I would be mm. guessing um, that that's happening a lot. But then you probably also have like your own ideas about where things should go and stuff, or or. Like how was that kind of period? Yeah, it's a it's a good question. There's a a, a balance to be had there for sure, and I think this varies um, yeah. by teams and what you're building and how you're building. But um, we again had this early conviction and an early picture of not just the sort of the next steps, what this will look like, you know, um, in the next version we ship, but also like further out into the future, these bigger pieces, other pieces we want to bring in, and so we were lucky or maybe again, this is just sort of aligning with, with the sort of um, the market and the end user. Um, we, we didn't have to sort of deviate wildly from the, the overall vision um, while still taking on board, like plenty of feedback and ideas. Um, and that's also, I think maybe the nature of the platform because the vision is so broad, there's all these different pieces that we know we want to do. A lot of the feedback um, and requests fit into that, big vision and then it was just a matter of reprioritizing if we wanted to this is a thing that that yeah we knew we wanted to do um if we get a sort of burning request for it um maybe we can bubble it up the priority list um and so yeah there was nothing like too sort of um disruptive i guess on the sort of roadmap um, a lot of it was fitting in nicely and it was just a little bit of the sort of dance of prioritizing for folks Certainly, once you have paying customers, this gets harder, um, of course, to, to balance, and you need to, um, you know, balance balance the request and balance the vision and, and prioritize uh, correctly, even if folks are trying to throw some money at you for something. But, um, but yeah, it's all worked out pretty well. And again, I think it goes back to just the fundamental idea of like we were building for ourselves and we were building for the mobile world and, and this kind of um, this kind of user. And there's just been enough alignment there that that it's kind of continued to to work. The the classic we were solving our own problem, and I think that's how you know you see it pay off well um, down the line. More more tactically, huge thing for us, and we still make heavy heavy use of this. Uh, Slack Connect, um, game changer. Uh, just like certainly the early days, but with, uh, almost all of our customers, it is a paid sort of support level now. Um, but we will also open it up for folks that are uh, running trials with us. Um, and just the, the sort of speed and ease of communicating there, answering questions, um, kind of assuring teams as well. You become a kind of a fly on the wall and, and almost an extension of some of these teams. I mean, I think that's really appreciated. Um, and they know that they're talking to, uh, well, the founders oftentimes, but also engineers, fellow engineers, fellow mobile engineers, um, folks who have worked on mobile product. Um, and that, that has been huge, um, because again, like big platform touches a lot of stuff. Um, and, uh, and we want to kind of partner with teams through that sort of, um, that warming up, uh, kind of period. So yeah, Slack Connect has been has been big. It is not infinitely scalable. 
So that's going to be something that's, that's coming for sure. I know there are tools for this now, actually. Um, but, but making sure that we're not overwhelmed with this stuff, but it's been all right so far. Yeah. That, it seems like that would be, especially for, for someone like Runway, where you're, as you said, for better and worse, for the challenge and the benefit, you are very, very essential and kind of like difficult thing that people do care about. And when it goes wrong, it's very, very bad. If that, like, if someone can't ship a release, they're very, mm. very, um, concerned. And so having someone in from your team who is like very, has a lot of expertise that is suddenly now like a part of their Slack organization must be like mm. a real big selling point. Whereas if it was like, you know, a kind of a small thing that's only, they don't, you know, only deal with once a year and, you know, they probably don't want that anyone from that team joining their organization, um, on Slack. Definitely. It's, uh, it's something that again, we need to be mindful of, uh, balance. That's a recurring theme, I suppose, is balance, but, uh, you know, you, you don't want to cross the line into a sort of, or maybe you can, but we're not trying to cross the line into like services, you know, business. Um, and, we're not, we're not there for sure. Um, but if you go further in that direction, it kind of turns into that. And for sure, like sometimes there's a bit of, it feels like a bit of appetite for that kind of thing. Um, where folks do want that sort of extension of the team in a more formal way and that, that reassurance and that resource. Um, um, so you could probably go and, I mean, it turns into sort of a tooling DevOps agency model, maybe, which I've seen maybe some examples of recently, but, um, not wanting to cross that line. And I think we're okay there, but, uh, but yeah, another place to balance. Yeah. Maybe, um, so next question is maybe fast forwarding a little bit because I guess there's like, so you did your first cohort, but I guess at some point you were like, okay, right. We've got something that people like, um, and we need customers. We need to show that we've got growth. Um, could you talk a bit about like, the, about that period, um, and what, what you did at first to start getting customers? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, the kind of most concrete answer is really what opened the first or the next, I guess, cohort of, um, customers and, and paying customers, um, happened coming out of YC. Um, and so, uh, you know, if there's, if there's one thing I can say about sort of having gone through YC pros and cons, whatever, one of the big pros is, is a, uh, well, there's two actually. One is the the um, the community. Um, of course, like YC alums are composed of many uh, mobile first or mobile forward, you know, companies um, who have gone on and done really well and are big now. Um, so we definitely leaned into that. Um, it's it's not a whole lot better than just like pure cold outbound, but it's slightly warmer sometimes. Um, so we leaned into that, and we we landed a few first customers that way. Um, and then the other sort of thing is, um, uh, inbound. And this is not, you know, this is not sort of advice that you can just go and, uh, turn on and make happen. But there were a few nice spikes coming out of YC, different sort of coverage and stuff where we got kind of noticed and picked up, um, for the first time. Um, and that definitely led to our first like big, big spike in inbound interest. Um, and, uh, we had a lot of, uh, a lot of great demos coming off of that. Um, and, uh, a whole bunch of feature requests, like the platform was still, still relatively in its infancy. Um, and so features, integrations, um, having all these integration points, but only supporting like maybe one or two tools that folks use at each of these points, um, a constant thing. And it's still a thing. Um, and we're trying to just keep hammering out the, uh, kind of the most commonly used tools, um, across the world for all these different kinds of mobile teams. Um, which takes effort. So there's just a lot of great demos where it's like, oh, but like we want to integrate XYZ tool at Runway's project management uh, integration point. Um, and it's like not ready yet, you know, start a trial. We'll try to prioritize it. It's the whole, whole kind of, um, again, trying to sort of balance and, and take on the demand and, and cater to the unique needs of all these different teams. But, uh, but once again, this is what, this is what we've sort of signed up for. Um, we are this plug and play platform that should adapt to and work with the whole variety of ways of doing things. So different workflows and also the different tools that teams use. 
Yeah. So we knew what we were getting into. So you have a lot of demos, you work with teams, you expand that sort of that pool of research of understanding the like myriad ways that teams do things, how they have things set up. And that was super valuable too. Even if we were having these discussions with teams, didn't go anywhere, uh, more data points, more inputs to understand the next time um, we encounter teams like this, these are some things they might be looking for. Um, and so further like feeding and prioritizing roadmap was huge. Yeah. So the first, yeah, the first cohort paying customers is a mix of, um, I mean, concretely outbound and inbound. Um, and we went from there and the thing that started happening, which is, which is great. And we want to lean into and leverage however we can. Um, you can't force this though, is sort of the network effect. Um, we're focusing on that a lot this year, um, but becoming not just a known name, but like a known kind of tooling. We are, we're category creating here. This is, this is a new, this is a new thing in team stacks. Um, and so we need to go out and sort of make people aware of the fact that like there is a solution and there's a better way to be doing things. Um, and it's worth giving it a try and you need to sort of define language around it, which we still are kind of working on. Um, but the whole category creation playbook, like really defining the language and really running with it in every kind of channel, every space, not something we've done as deliberately as we probably should be doing. So it's something we're looking at. And then, yeah, so becoming a known name, but also a known category, like someone is on a team wondering if they can offload all this friction and like burden around releases. Like, yeah, there is a, there's a, a tool for that. Like there's a release management platform. Um, you should go, go look for one of those. Um, so that slowly takes hold. Um, and, uh, and then you have folks telling their friends in the mobile world. Especially these days, there's a lot of kind of turnover on teams and folks jumping across to different teams. And um, ideally, they've had this awesome experience um, using Runway, making their lives easier at a previous team. Um, they come to a new team and suddenly they're back in this old mode of like annoying, burdensome, error prone releases. Um, and so they they think of us and they raise it to the team and it kind of goes from there. So that's that great sort of motion that you really want to get get towards that has started happening as we have become more known. And as this, as, as a kind of tool has become more, more understood, it's easier for folks, for example, who bring us over to other teams to not have to tell the whole story themselves, which can be hard. There's more sort of existing dialogue and, and existing knowledge there. If that makes sense. Yeah. 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 It, it makes sense. It seems like, like a few factors kind of combining to, to mean that I guess there's a lot of conversations involved. This is, I, I would imagine compared to some other tools, maybe people are less likely to just discover it, discover runway, set themselves up, start using it in the team. It might be a bit more like having to overcome their thoughts around like, and, and, and really explain it and have a conversation. Yeah, for sure. Um, and that's been a big area of focus. What does the, what does the go to market motion actually look like most closely? Um, and there's a few, there's a few different sort of motions, but for sure, um, all of our customers at some point are going to end up on a call with, uh, usually me or with our, uh, one of our AEs. Um, there's going to be kind of a demo slash sync, um, and it can happen at different points in time. Um, so there's kind of like a fully sales led motion. Folks come in, they might loop in some folks on the team and then we have a demo conversation starts from there. Um, and, uh, and then goes, there's another motion since we launched self service, um, which was important to us where the first action someone takes is to sign up. Um, that's cool. Cause they can start poking around. Um, but until relatively recently, there wasn't a whole lot you could do and get set up if you didn't have, um, you didn't have the buy-in from your team. You didn't have the sign off on larger orgs that you might need to go and connect a bunch of integrations. Um, there's kind of these just like process related roadblocks that exist. Um, and so what we focused on is like keeping that, keeping that entry point open. Folks can sign up, they can come in, have their first experience. Um, it's not going to be a full on aha moment right away because you're not going to be able to get all connected, but focusing on, on ways to start the conversation in the product and start educating people about 
how it can look and feel. Um, and so we've built out, we have a sandbox, but also within the product, if folks have pieces that aren't connected um, yet, we built out little toggles to toggle on demo mode. Um, and it's going to fill in a part of the product with some representative kind of data um, and just start planting those seeds, start giving a sense for what things look like. Um, and so folks can get started that way. We do have some teams that will sign up and they'll do what they need to do on their side to start connecting integrations up and running. Um, and then uh, maybe never talk to us, but but maybe end up on a call just to tie up some loose ends, um, address some lingering questions and uh, and go from there. Um, so, so yeah, but you're right. It's a complex product and very often for the kinds of teams we most, most often are um, kind of in front of um there's steps there's buy-in there's consensus building um, and all of that slows down a sales cycle that also pushes it a little bit away from self-serve um so you try to sort of treat self-serve as for now this changes too when we get get bigger for sure but for now kind of lead gen keep the door open be welcoming get folks in start the conversation um and and go from there it takes many touches you know maybe someone has seen sponsorship in a newsletter maybe they've seen us at an event um Maybe they come into the product, they poke around. Um, there is a, a multi-touch sort of like education process that, that can happen. Um, so you just want to make sure you're there in different ways for different folks on the team when they're, when they're ready to talk or explore. Yeah, that makes sense. Like harder maybe to measure and do be very like kind of data driven on like, we just need to mm. put this much ad budget and we'll, yeah, it's uh, tricky. Yeah, that's been very top of mind to measure the multi-touch. Um, the attribution has to be really good. Um, and our, uh, our head of growth, Riley, has done a lot here um, to make sure the ops and the instrumenting is there for it. But very often, I'm, I mean, our CRM, I'm sort of looking at a deal and you see like different people who have sort of been interacted with or have, have sort of reached out in different places, different times. There's a lot interesting sort of like threads to, to pick up. Yeah. Yeah. So very, very short side. Which CRM do you use, by the way, just in case anyone listening is thinking about that? We are, we are on HubSpot, um, which, HubSpot. Uh, yeah, which does the job um, for sure. They, the job. they are very good at uh, making you pay more for every little extra bit of functionality uh, and seats and capacity that you need to add. They've nailed, nailed that um, expand game. But it's a great tool. It's doing everything we needed to do, and and there's a lot you can do with it. So, yeah, it's been pretty good. Yeah, awesome, awesome. Yeah, I don't think we've ever spoken about CRMs actually on the <laughs> on the podcast. So, so, so first, um, that's awesome. Uh, so I think we're we're coming up to time, Gabe. Um, but I wondered if you wanted to kind of share like uh, where you kind of see the future direction. I'm not sure we even quite got up to the current day of runway. <laughs> But uh, kind of what kind of things you're focused on uh, in the future of Romley? For sure. Yeah. I mean, high level, um, it is a few things. But one of the big ones is actually still what we were talking about earlier. There's these sort of different axes to the product, right? There's the breadth. There's like the width. Like we are present. We're doing stuff at all these different sort of points of a release cycle. Now, increasingly different points of also the development life cycle more broadly. Um, we want to continue expanding the, the width, the breadth in that direction. Um, there's other parts of the process that they're not entirely different. Like it's all hand in hand, a uh, uh, part of the platform we just shipped, um, build distro has to do with, uh, making distributing different flavors of builds way easier. Um, and that has a lot to do with releases as you're preparing release candidates, but it's also something that should be happening throughout the development life cycle. So you can get builds into the hands of testers, like QA folks, designers to check stuff, product owners. Um, so anyway, expanding uh, outwards, and then of course, um, expanding downwards. So vertically, um, we, you know, what we were talking about before, comparing the, the very early days to now, we are so much deeper as a platform for any given sort of part of the platform. There's way more runway can do, way more we can automate, way more we can, you know, pull in and surface, um, but we can go so much deeper. Um, and so that's uh, definitely in focus. 
parts of the process where it makes sense for us to actually sort of um, go even deeper with some roots and and take on more of whatever might be happening at that part of the process. Um, it's like the high high level focus, I suppose. Um, if I had to really boil it down. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. Um, and yeah, thanks so much for joining Gabe. Um, if people want to learn more about runway and about you, where can they, where can they do that? Let's see, uh, about runway runway.team, um, is our website. Um, there's the usual stuff about product and stuff. Um, I think, uh, the coolest part is our sandbox. So you can kind of get in there and you see, again, a sort of demo instance. You can see a bit about how it looks and feels. Um, so check that out. Uh, if you're interested for your team, of course, you can schedule a demo through the site, um, and, uh, check out our docs. Oh, we also have a a micro site. We're trying to do more of these, but this is kind of neat. Uh, we collect aggregated review times data. Um, and so that's updated live and you can see sort of like how long the queue is trending um, on the iOS, uh, Apple side, um, some other stats on build processing times ah, and stuff. super cool. Yeah, so there's a, there should be a link out to that from the site as well. Um, for more on me, I don't have a huge online footprint to be honest, <laughs> but uh, most active <laughs> sadly on LinkedIn these days. Um, so feel free to reach out or connect on there. And uh, yeah, would love to chat to any mobile folks who are curious about what we're, what we're up to. Amazing. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining, Gabe. Um, Yeah. Thanks everyone for listening. Thanks for having me.